Uh, I, I was a victim of sexual child abuse in Boy Scouts of America, and uh, and I I came forward as a, a 14 year old boy and and stood up and there was a huge cover up and I fought against it and I got you know you you know the story you you, you mentioned you read that but um, a, anyway so I did a lot of advocacy work for victims of abuse and one thing I noticed is is if these stories like if people were uh, abused and leaders covered it up and places where we go to trust and love cover it up. It, these people over the years, it's like they would go mentally ill. The, the trauma was just like a like a ghost with unfinished business, just coming back to them, back to them. And what, one thing I I had that too. And then when finally a lot of the world news or the the news started to tell the story, and people started to you know, it won the Scripps Award. It was like a runner up for a Pulitzer Prize, and I just I saw that and. Just this craziness started to leave me that is, you know, where I tell my story and I just apologize for it all the time and feel so bad and so much shame. And it just all started to leave me. And I felt like I could live a normal life and not have to rethink this because I had, I had vindicated this, but I, 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 the right things that happened, this person couldn't hurt more people the way they'd hurt me. And that these organizations couldn't cover it up the way they covered it up, you know. And you get this situation with Jody and, and I mean, she's, she, in my experience, was far more uh, dangerous than the pedophile that abused me. Uh, far, far more damaging and far more destructive. Wow. And yeah, that's a lot because this was a terrible thing that happened in the past. And I didn't, you know, I, I mean, like she was like a whole nother level. And the thing about it is she has you know, I, I don't know me. I'm for sure there's hundreds of victims that were directly under her, but there's probably thousands of people that are their family members. And, and maybe she's got thousands of clients. I, I don't know, but she has this massive amount of people that are probably going through this craziness, not knowing what happened to them as they were abused. And I don't want to talk about it. I'm shaking, holding the phone, even mentioning it. It's not going to make my day better. I, you know, it's not going to make me and my wife feel more peaceful and our baby and just be happy for the rest of the day talking about it. It's really traumatizing. But the, the thing that I know is I know that if we share the correct form of truth, that people will see who this person really is. And it's a hard thing to do with Jody. It's super difficult to do with her. And, and you know, it's, it'll make sense. But if we share that truth and people see how bad she really is and what she's really done, I hope to God that these victims of hers will start to feel less crazy and start to feel less shame and less problems. And, and, and to me that that's worth screwing up my week or my evening or my day or, or my month just by getting traumatized by telling this terrible stuff that I don't want to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you uh, for being there for the victims. Uh, Adam, if, if, if you feel safe enough or um, are in a good enough place to share, can you share why she was worse? What made her next level? Uh, it's going to be pretty explicit and pretty intense. So if people don't want to listen to this they shouldn't listen to this but if they want the truth it will the reality about it i mean what jody did to my life feels as a victim of child abuse coming forward feels like being like being fucked backwards it feels like she tried to make me be the person abusing children force that into my head that image force that into society force it everywhere and show that i had this terrible problem and use that as leverage over me i mean it, it's the only thing i can think of that's worse than being a child and being abused would be being a parent forced to abuse your own child and jody tried in every way to create that false narrative and reality around my life so when she violated records of letting my personal records go or my, my personal private records. Sorry, it's hard to even talk. My, my medical records 
what she actually was doing was going around creating her own medical records that she never did when I was her patient and using the psych evaluation records from my psych evaluation for the scouting case where I sued scouting to show the damage of what happened to me. And there's this, uh, this fear that you have where as a kid in Idaho, they have all sorts of ignorance there and they teach you that if you're, you're, you know, if you're abused, then you could become like that. I know that was a, a normal insecurity that a clinical psychologist would totally understand with the victim. And there was a, like a part of it where I said that I was scared of what people would think because there were people that come up in Mormon, Idaho, and they'd be like, Hey, can you be around these kids? Are you okay? Is this, and it just, it robbed my innocence. I, I was terrified of uh, what that terrible pedophile did to me. The last thing in the world, it's like if you escaped from a Holocaust camp and somebody was like, uh, oh, we're scared you're going to go start your own Holocaust camp. You know, it, it was the last thing in the world that these people in the little town, you know, talking, they're so traumatizing. And they'd be like, well, you are you safe around kids because this happened to you? And I mean, that I talked about that in my psych evaluation. I was scared of what would happen when people would look at me like that if I was just in normal settings. And, and so, you know, Jody took parts of that, like, oh, this guy, he can't be around kids. He's, he's a victim and he doesn't know what safe boundaries are. See, he says he's scared of what would happen around kids. She didn't mention that I wasn't talking about what would happen between me and kids. I was talking about what would happen between parents looking at me like I was different because I was a victim of abuse. And that's what Jody Hildebrandt, she ran around with these records that had a protective order on them because sensitive details with non-professionals non could, could take something, a little detail change, and they could draw a completely different conclusion. There's a reason these records were protected. I would never talk about this publicly because I don't want anyone to mix these details up. But this, if we want to know the truth about how someone like Jody can take subtle little differences and create majorly different outcomes to destroy people's lives, knowing what they're doing, exactly what they're doing. You know, this is, this is Jody Hildebrandt. So, so I, 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 I did go to the world to come forward and talk about a sexual abuser. And I did go to stop these people as a kid in camp and all the cover up later. I always avoided talking about what Jody Hildebrandt did to me because the world, I didn't feel it would be ready for sensitive details because I had been abused so significantly from, from what this lady did to my, to my life. And so, um, yeah, I just need to pause for a minute. Do you want to say something? Yeah, absolutely. Pause. Thank you, Adam, for for everything you're sharing. We can't imagine. Um, John's been nodding as as he listens with with. Well, it's 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 partly disbelief. I mean, I'm a professional mental health person too, and you know our our job is always to help people, right? To do no harm first and then to help people. And I just can't imagine taking a patient's information and using it against them, you know? So uh, I'm sorry you had to go through that. I, You know, it's so contrary to what we do. Um, she did, as as we understand it, she did, however, lose her license for a, for a bit. Did, did, did she ever regain her license? Um, there's, so, there's a lot more about that. Like she had an incredibly powerful attorney team of attorneys from the the same attorneys that represent the University of Utah to okay. protect her from I mean, it was a huge ordeal yeah to get Doppel to to go after this lady yeah that's crazy the, um she did get cited for having a dual relationship with my ex-wife and she did get cited 
for sharing my confidential medical records. I've read the press, they talk a lot about the medical records. They don't talk about the dual relationship. I don't know if they've all seen that yet. No, we haven't found what. So what was the dual relationship? Was she was she meeting with your ex-wife privately or having a relationship with her? What was what was that? I'm trying to slow it down here because I, I don't want to tell too much of my story. Uh, so but the the criminal aspect of a dual relationship's interesting because I, on one hand, a dual relationship could be, oh, maybe a psychiatrist liked their patient. Or on another hand, it could be their psychiatrist was like, I can earn money if my patient goes out and gets customers for me. Or on another hand, a psychiatrist could be like, I could earn a lot more money if I had super high profile patients that fit my doctrine. Even if they're not that way, if I could turn them into that. And, you know, the, the thing about Jody is, uh, you know, the dual relationship thing. Yeah, I mean, just have a hard time answering that because I, I got some real direct answers, but I just got done talking to those guys about getting ready for our, for our interview. Sure. If I tell, tell it all here, then... then uh, then that will that will change, but the uh, and really um, quickly, Adam, I'll just say those that are uh, wondering, we're referring to an interview you're about to do with Mormon Stories and host John Delenn. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and we, I, I felt. Go ahead. Part of the reason I wanted to really give him the run with this was because I I felt that most most of Jody's victims, because she vic- she victimizes the far extreme. Mormon group, that they would be, you know, their lives fall apart and broken. They'd probably be listening to John DeLenn's thing, and that would be a place where a lot of them could be helped. For those that might be listening, please head over to Mormon Stories for more of Adam's story. We, we will make sure to send everyone there. Thank you for sharing here with Hidden True Crime as well. Here's something I'm not going to talk about in Mormon Stories, just because there, there's a term, it's, it's called the friction of complexity. I, I, I kind of made that term up, but it's a term that when a subject is too complex, it starts to create friction in people's minds, where mm-hmm. it just slows down and they can't apprehend, comprehend it, or people have a visceral response to it. That's it's great. That's thing. great. I'm on That's, board with that term. Yeah, so there's a lot of friction of complexity in the story. <laughs> yeah. And and I have to be careful because if I even start to summarize it, I feel that the friction of complexity gets so big that I start to feel like I need to apologize and I've done stuff wrong. You mix it in with the triggers and the shame and all that stuff and well it just sends me in like a and and so but I mean I'm I'm navigating through this with you guys because the truth matters. Yeah. And those people out there, their healing matters. I, I know a lot of people who like race to help children, but these people, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, whatever these people are out there that are victims of this stuff, their lives matter. Yes. And and they matter a lot. And they they matter up there with how children's lives matter. They are super important. And Jody preyed on these people like nobody's business. And so I want I want the truth out there. Um I'm trying to think of a few Well what do you, the, go ahead. Go no go ahead Adam. Oh go go ahead. What's your question? Go ahead, John well John yeah, had a I, question yeah, too. Yeah I had a um so you mentioned that she's she's preying on on kind of these fringe LDS groups or people that would <laughs> Did, would she fit within that profile or, I mean, did, would she be an extreme LDS believer too? Or where do you see her fitting in terms of her religious beliefs? I kind of feel like when Ted Bundy joined the Mormon church. Okay. You know, where it was convenient, it helped for a purpose. It was, it was, it worked to get her close to the people that she wanted to hurt. Okay. And what do you think happened with um, 
be on your story, see, seeing her finally in the news connected to Ruby, Frankie, and this child abuse. Do you feel then yeah. that Jody is is the leader here, is the one seeing, it, uh, seeing an opportunity? It's the history that I've seen of the kind of people Jody, Jody uses for her thing. It, it, that lady, even though she had 2.5 million followers on YouTube, her uh, she she tells in comparison to the control the controlling factor of Jody. Like it's it's Jody, to really understand Jody, um, you need to understand that I. Uh, I, I don't know, once upon a time, the group of people that were Mormon and they had issues with pornography and masturbation, right? So they would feel really bad. They were not temple worthy. They weren't good enough. So they go to Jody to save the temple marriages and all that stuff. And the modern times happened. The internet came out. Almost everybody looked at porn and masturbated sometimes. And in the real world outside of this little group of people didn't feel that the same cause and effect would happen for masturbation and porn they, 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 they looked at it like oh yeah it's a normal part of life and these people aren't doing all these crazy things but there's this little tight bubble they felt like if you do these little things this uh you know this extreme thinking is well, way worse things could happen they, they're indoctrinated or religiously taught this that you know what you know it's, it's, it's just this whole thing where it's like like, you know, you're thinking of one scripture you learned at church and then another and you time together and soon you're on the slippery slide where looking at a woman and thinking about her wrong is the same thing as committing adultery, which is the next thing to murder. And, and you're just like some bright, beautiful child wondering about, you know, and trying to make sense of this stuff. These are vulnerable people in a changing world. And and Jody came along and knew how to exploit that in a very very dangerous way and she yeah i don't think she has anything to the church outside of just a sociopathic relationship to get closer to her host wow wow uh would she talk to you about distortion then has this distortion thing been a continuous thing truth versus distortion so can you describe what you mean by distortion? Go ahead, John. Yeah, I, you know, and just in listening to a little a bit of her um, show, I don't know, what was her video show? Was that like a YouTube channel? She uh, was doing um, connection shows with Ruby, and we've been watching them and assessing a bit of Jody, And she goes into truth versus distortion. We're all living in distortion and... and she is truth. Pretty much it gets down to truth. Yeah, the, I think, um, so one of the things I picked up is that the, the, her her therapeutic perspective, I think, is is really simple. So you talk about the friction of complexity. This is like, I don't even know how to describe her worldview. Let's call it the simplicity of simplicity or something. But um, her... Her perspective, it seems to me, revolves around three things. Choices, boundaries, and distortion. She talks about those things all the time. Can we, can we pause for a second? Just because those are just triggers for me. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll I'm pause. sorry. And the, and the reason why, and I'll explain why, is none of that geometry, that, that, that logical geometry of hers, is real. It's all abstract language that she created because she knows how to navigate a manipulative area that I don't understand. Okay. But what we can ground about this lady is that she showed her face, this ugly stuff that she's doing, just multiple times she's popped up with different names. Mm. You know, she, she was at the, the Elks Lodge up Provo Canyon I, th I think, I'm pretty sure she was there running things when Lindsay Lohan was there getting abused. Or Lindsay, or not Lohan, uh, Paris, Paris Hilton. Yeah, Paris Hilton. Uh, in fact, I think she bragged about how she was so elite with this group. And she she showed up in Lifestar. 
and you know she was just in a chapter but then she went off on her whole big thing again creating the same stuff and then she's another she shows up in connections but she's always teaching the exact same forms of manipulation in all these different places that i can tell i, I don't know as well back then but i heard her stories and stuff but the the thing that you need to, you need i i'm gonna segue and, and i can talk openly about this because i'm not planning on sharing this with Mormon stories what we want to do is just but the the basis of control is interesting because like you know um when people are really scared they give power to a leader in an unorthodox way uh, like 9 11 everybody was scared all sides that usually fight give all the power to the president in an unprecedented way because it's this fear this uh creates this qualitative fear that scares people so much and, it, and if you're a real controlling leader it, it makes the people subconsciously feel that that's validated when they have that fear that fear fearful feeling you know jody's jody's measures of control would work great for like pedophiles in prison serial rapists to talk about all those boundaries and all that stuff to enforce it vigorously to, to follow through all those narratives it makes sense and that's you know control is interesting it's like it's morally okay if i go and push somebody real hard without asking for their permission if a car is going to hit them and they can't see the car and there's not enough time to do anything else so controlling a situation is dependent on what level of threat's really there and what's going on and when you get people that use those kinds of control when the threat level's not there and when it's not going on then that's a concerning thing like why are they why are they doing this and then if you if you thought into this person's mind that there's not very many serial rapists there's not very many those aren't the fun people to hang out with jody wanted to rise in power and be like a goddess of the cult you don't want to hang out with a bunch of people in prison for convicted crimes you want to be really powerful and influent but she her doctrine is the kind that's it's for these kinds of people this hardened stuff but if there's this huge group of people that don't qualify for that what can you do to their minds that makes them feel like they qualify for that kind of treatment and that goes right into how she works and i, I you know i can explain like the how she began and what she did and what she said how it progressed and how she did it how she worked with these people and eventually you can kind of understand what happened if you could understand that her objective was you know i don't know how common a rapist is a serial rapist or or a pedophile or something like that or some serious person that needs to have their freedom taken away to stop them from being a danger to society but they're sure as hell not as common as somebody that's masturbated Right. Yeah, they're they're right. They're not common at all. I mean, that the, the point is, is that maybe these people that do these other things are really, really rare compared to normal people. So how is it that Jody would get the indoctrinate these people into thinking this way? And the the thing that I think happened right off the bat was that she needed people to believe that it wasn't the the action that you performed that showed that you had an addiction it was the, the problem in your head like this abstract so the, what you actually did to act out on it didn't matter hmm. so that was like a one of her like big steps is what you actually do doesn't matter you know whether it's you know whether it's jaywalking illegally and you're addicted to that or reading the scriptures too much or talking inappropriately or whether you look at you know like whether whether they kidnap people and rape people or whatever she turned it back into the situation that it's the addiction in your head not the actual behavior in real life it's the problem wow so suddenly she opens this door to everybody that's been fighting some personal struggle and put them all in a room together united with this euphoric feeling and it's a dangerous place to go.
Yeah. Was she trying to do that? Was she trying to create a group? These are apps. So, so, uh, a literal group. We're asking. Yeah, like a cult. No, no. I'm I'm trying to. Yo, know, she's have these therapy groups that you go to. Okay. For, like I, I went to one for for. I thought it was marriage counseling. My bishop sent me there. Right. And and when the, you know, I would have walked out the door if I thought that I was in a therapy group with somebody that had been arrested for sexually explicit, having sexual victims. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not in that category. I have a fierce history of fighting against people that mess with people sexually. Yeah. Right. So, right. So the, if I hear you correctly, Adam, I think part, so part of what you're saying is like with, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's how she tricks people into the group. Yeah. That like with you, so you were a victim of, of, of sexual abuse and she transformed that or wanted to transform that or get you to believe that somehow you were also an offender. And so oh. I, I think what she's saying, what, what I hear you saying is that in, in the case of porn or masturbation, she seemingly is taking that idea and getting people to believe because they're doing that, that they're somehow rapists or could be rapists. Right. Is that, I mean like that type her of first, thing. Her first step is to dislodge people's minds that the actual way that you act out is important. All that matters is the addiction in your head, this abstract idea. Right. And she okay. starts enticing people with huge feelings of empowerment and yeah. then conflicting it with huge fears, like psychosexual manipulative fears, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's like she masturbates you right out of your mind. Wow. I, I don't mean to say it like that, but it's so gross and creepy and sexual and euphoric being in one of her classes the kind of content you you sit there and you think you know it's one thing when the confession's talking about a traumatic thing but sometimes you wonder if it's like a new porn video huh when when they focus on it obsessively bringing it up you're sitting there thinking are these people getting off on this and like i was creeped out and the thing was it didn't start that way it was not like that in the beginning it was like, hey, it's, you know, couples therapy, come here. This is great. You're Mormon. And addiction could be anything. These are actual quotes from Jody. You know, addiction could be anything. Even if you just read your scriptures too much, it's not how you act out. It's just that you have an addiction in your head. You know, and 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 uh, and then really right in the beginning talking about like, stake presidents and the mayor of Salt Lake and other famous people that, you know, general authorities that need help from her because, you know, you're, you're you're Mormon, you can do whatever the church leaders say. And here's this lady that's just saying, like, qualifying this extreme, what she's going to do in the, you know, just herself. And you don't know what it's extreme yet. Qualifying herself. Uh, and that, you know, by, by grabbing these people that you put your trust in and stuff and that they're all doing it. So, you know, it's just, you do it too. And, you know, it's just your fjord feel. And it's also this feeling. It's like, oh, real famous and powerful, important people. And she's spending all this time on me, you know? And then she, this feeling like, oh, it doesn't matter how you, hey, whatever your addiction is, whether you read the scriptures too much, you have problems with food, you know, it, none of this stuff matters, whether it's a sexual issue. It, it doesn't matter. It's all the addiction thing in your head. And she just really, really makes that feel like everybody's off the hook with what their actual actions are. It's this issue in our head. We're going to get to the bottom of this. You guys are going to trust me. Powerful people do. You're super important. This is exclusive. That's that's the kind of stuff. And fortunately for some people, they, one of their partners really takes it. The other one starts to worry. You know, and it, that kind of happens. But so, so then, uh, once she's removed from people, the sensitivity, the, the uh, proportionality of their offenses, and turned it into this abstract idea of addiction. And she starts teaching these violations of boundaries, and starts to get really strict, and shows each other how to punish each other for by confronting a certain way and disrupting everything and starts to justify people. And she's just swinging back and forth in the background, these 
super empowerment lifestyle she has and all this celebrity does and this power and then these super psychosexual fears of what will happen if these addictions keep going out of control right okay so but she doesn't really like in the beginning it's just this charismatic funny girl laughing not using real intense topics not talking about too intense stuff you're there with your spouse six weeks eight weeks goes by And now she's going to divide you into two different groups, the guys in one group and the women in the other group. And this is where the sociopath deception starts to begin. I mean, mean, it was already, this is where she's going to act like she's teaching one group one thing and the other another, and she's going to do stuff that's just completely different. So is that, was that her standard procedure? She would... She would get people into to marital counseling and then split the men from the women in different groups? Yeah, after like six or eight weeks. And then she'd be wanting to do individual counseling alongside group counseling. And then she would split them up in groups. And you'd be in a group of guys. And, you know, I, I never forget it. It was marriage counseling, which I was okay with. Charismatic, cool lady talking about everything that my wife seems to be less depressed about and happy and energetic to try to make change in her life. You know, it's like starting to control people for their behavior, but like on a minor level, not like, like, not like crazy stuff, but like, like just minor stuff. And, you know, and the thing is about it is just like, once she, you know, the, the first huge alarm that went off to me is that i'm in the, i'm a victim of abuse real sensitive to people that have been sexual predators in a group of people who none of our actions actually matter it's just the addiction in our head that matters so we're all in there for the same reason and then right. they started asking people to talk about the things that they'd done when they acted out and there's like four people in my group one kid is a survivor of that polygamous cult down in Utah. He's got terrible trauma from what those people did to him. Nice, super nice kid. Another kid in the group is a sexual perpetrator. He's got victims. He does exploit exhibitionism in public. Wow. And another person in the group was he uh, was he convicted that 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 person? I don't know. Okay. All I know is it freaks the hell out of you when you're like, "Oh, I stole a Sammy's apple out of the picnic basket," and someone else is like, "Oh, I brought photography in the same basket." Right. <laughs> you know, you're just like <laughs> you're like, "Wait, this is marital counseling." Jody said. Jody said it was all the same. It was. It doesn't matter what we do. It's just the addiction in our head. Huh. You know that. There was an, and then another guy in there. He was a perp- sexual perpetrator. Also, he he was the opposite. Oh, see, so there's expo- expo- There's one that like voyeur. She, he was a voyeurist. And he was talking about all his voyeuring problems that he was working on. Wow. And and I'm sitting there like, I don't want to be in this basket. Right. Yeah. I came for marriage counseling, as you said. <laughs> well, right. yeah. Like- this was- that's what's the first red flag. I was like, I, I know I want to, you know, we all want to be like Jody and we all want to speak the truth and we all want this stuff, but like, there's a difference between a sexual predator, you know, that, 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 that was the problem. She had literally removed from all these people that she indoctrinated them with this religious idea of how was it, an addiction and the context of how it was, how you acted out didn't matter. And she went through all these abstract languages about boundaries and create all these emotional situations between spouses and they calloused over time. And she, the control got tighter and tighter. And she was somehow just giving these people this euphoric feeling for controlling the other person. That was just like a drug. And I, you know, then that was kind of this creep. The thing is like, yeah, it was just, it was just so, um, you know, I had to go home. This was my level of innocence. I had to go home and look up an addictionary 
or, or it was on online, what voyeurism was and what exhibitionism was. Cause I didn't know. Yeah. That's, that's the day I learned. Yeah, so I, when I, I, when I talk, go ahead. I think you, I, <laughs> I think you went through the wrong door when you were trying to find that group. <laughs> Well, you know, when your bishop's brother owns Lifestar and this multi-million dollar organization making money off of members of the church who struggle with pornography. Was she involved with Lifestar? She was their coach. She, when, when I came across Jody, she was on the top list of referrals for the LDS social services, and she was a Lifestar coach, and she was going to church meetings. She was talking to priesthood leaders, and she was soliciting from talks on Sundays for her, her patients. And so you, you take somebody like Jody, and she is an expert in manipulating people's subconscious to make them go in a different direction than what would be good for them because she uses visceral violent or visceral sexual manipulation. You know, she takes like, you know, these budding people, they're young married couples and they just want to love each other and they want these goals. This isn't what perpetrators are thinking. That's not why the perpetrators are in the class that the judge ordered them to be in. They're like volunteers in normal lives coming out of their religion, trying to make their marriages better and stuff. And, and, you know, I remember, uh, when I, uh, let's see, right, what was it? I think it was the last day that we had the couples group. But they brought some guy in, and he was, like, he seemed like a real trustworthy, honest, sincere, humbled guy that fought addiction and, be, and was a, very successful in other areas in his life. And he was like, yeah, I was like, trying not to masturbate and look at porn sometimes. And I, I had this addiction and I didn't take it serious. And I didn't confront it. And then you know, soon it was, I woke up behind dumpsters with girls. I didn't know who didn't have teeth and I didn't know if I had AIDS and my life was over. And it, it just kind of like, they made you like think that if you had these little things, you would become like this terrible thing. And they just go back and forth that if you were in denial to this, then you would become this way. No, 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 no. You will become this way if you're acting like this, if you deny your addiction. Huh. And so, so to take that, um, you know, to, to take the qualitative, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to say it. it it's it's kind of like, like, you don't really, you, like there's first degree, first stage cancer, there's second stage, there's third stage, there's fourth stage. When someone gets first stage, they freak out and they think they have second stage, third stage, fourth stage. It's terrible. Jody creates an environment where she removes from people the, the actual actions and accountability. She, she, she makes it not matter and it's all about some abstract idea in their head. Then she makes people all feel like they're, fighting the same addiction on all, on all people of all different levels together, mixing that together. Yeah. And then she makes, makes people feel after she removes from them there, that then she makes people feel that like, uh, like, um, that if you got stage one, you, you got stage four. Yeah. If you got, in other words, you got these people uh, thinking that, that because they, didn't, I mean, I remember uh, I didn't masturbate. I didn't do porn. I was doing great through this program. I was going through it all. And and uh, nothing worked. They just got more and more upset at me. And more, they said my life was out of control. And I just remember just falling apart, thinking that I don't know what to do. I, I, I just don't know what to do. And I was literally Googling chemical castration, thinking that would help me the next step, like anything that I could do to stop, to get my life back so I could live a normal life and not be punished all the time for everything. And, and, and they, you know, they, they, they tuned in on that I was a victim of sexual child abuse and I brought it up and at some point because I did have PTSD and trauma about what happened to me as a kid. And they, they, they were like, that's your addiction speaking. Wow. That's your addiction. And if you talk about that, that's your addiction. And so they turn like, I mean, I get that it's not good to act like a victim when, when something bad happens, 
But in the English language, victim means, you know, like if somebody had their kid kidnapped and killed, I'd say that person's a victim of somebody having, of losing a child. Yeah. I wouldn't say that they're a person in denial who's going to use the abstract idea to violate everyone's boundaries in the room. Exactly. Right. And do you know, do you know what I mean? Absolutely. But like, so I just, I, you know, I, I didn't know where to go there. And, but I had, I, I remember, I mean, Jody gets people to talk about everything and then she uses this leverage over them. What, what and, do you think her motive is? Like, what is her actual motive in the end? So I think that Jody's main, I, I think she's got the motive of a, of a very, <laughs> I'm not say this right. I, I know there's a lot of evidence in my mind from the things that I've looked at that suggest that she has this dual operation where one, she gets these high profile people and she destroys them and feeds them into this machine where she wants huge amounts of less intelligent, normal people to follow. Okay. So, so she's, you know, she's like, she needs that kind of blood and then she needs all the, she needs people without hearts and brains to follow it. Okay. And, so and if they have a heart and a brain, she needs to destroy that so that then they will follow it. Power and fame. Well, yeah, if you, uh, you go back and forth. Yeah. So, so power, let, let's say that's a power and fame. And when I first heard that, uh, literally it was just last week that Jody's latest victim was this eight channels lady. I knew in two seconds, I knew in two seconds that Jody absolutely wanted that lady's platform mm -hmm. to become more powerful and yeah. that she would lie, lie to that lady. She would make that lady as, as mentally sick as a dog. Then she would lie to her like she was helping her and then she would steal that lady's power. Yeah. And I knew in two seconds that that lady was her patient, not her partner. Yeah. Not her business friend. And they could have called it different because she got in trouble with the relationship in the past. But I knew that was her patient. And I, and, and I could tell right away that that lady struggled with some control issues and maybe some narcissism. And it, it just lined up that that was a perfect patient that Jody would know how to complete. Like, like she was bad. She would have never done this stuff without Jody messing up her mind by making it so that her actions didn't matter. Like making her believe in a religion of thought that made the actions in the real world not matter. Yeah. That, that like I, I knew, I knew in two seconds because this isn't the first time, like she, she has um, needed this stuff to survive and make her plans. So like, my, my ex-wife was the daughter of a general authority. That's huge credit in Mormon church in the two, in the 1990s and the 2000s. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I just, and she wants money big time. And I, uh, Jody does. And I just want a scouting settlement. So we had the daughter of a general authority or area 70, they call it. No one knows the difference. And and then uh, in this, when they're using it for power, and and uh, a guy that just had a huge check from a settlement payment, and and you know when you, when you sit there and watch how much Jody wanted to say, the general authorities, I take care of their families, you know, yeah. to people that are totally engineered on to taking, not solving their own problems with sex or pornography or figuring out. How to, their, their own views on it, but just to do whatever a church leader says, she wanted that really, really bad. And so the dual relationship comes like where not only did she like, so, so I'm in this program with her and uh, with Jody and I'm in this group and I'm not comfortable. And I start telling my wife, I'm not comfortable. And my wife starts telling me that it's my addiction. Jody's telling her what to say. Uh, that it's my addiction acting out this saying I'm not comfortable. And I'm in this group with these guys that have sexual predator problems and I don't feel safe at all. I mean, I mean, and there was a little therapy and, you know, and the fact that if you, if you were like watching, you know, you know, I, I don't know, like if, if you watch somebody next to you do something horrific then you didn't want anything to do with that, you know, you know 
it, it's just not worth it. It was so uncomfortable. And, and, and so I'm watching, uh, I, I didn't say that last one, right? What I mean is that like, you know, like if you want to teach your kids not to cross the street with, without your permission, if they got to see someone hit by a car in the street every day, that would definitely do the job. Yeah. So, so in other words, she sees, she sees a general authority's family with a settlement check in you. And, uh, you know, she was living in a $3 million home. Those children escaped a $3 million home that was allegedly Jody's. Do you think then that... Oh, wow, she's filthy rich. It's the, 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 the dual relationship. So imagine you graduate from uh, some school, you got your four-year degree. Jody only got like a I think it was online two year degree or I, I don't know. It might have been a four year degree. But you know, so you get so imagine somebody gets this degree, they're a psychologist, they're gonna work with the patient. The patient pays what well, I have no idea. Maybe their insurance pays it. Maybe it's like eighty dollars an hour. Maybe you can earn a hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year working full time as a counselor in the, in an office. maybe that's what you can do. And that, that that's cool. But, you know, uh, that's like normal. Someone's joining the field not to earn huge amounts of money. They're joining, joining the field as a psychologist because they want to help people that have problems and figure out this stuff. Yeah, you're, so, you're talking about me there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you're next to a school teacher. <laughs> right, to, exactly. The intelligence that you I'm could not, have used somewhere else. <laughs> I'm not doing it because I see uh, big dollar signs. That's not why I'm getting in the field. No, oh, back back to Jody. Another core part of her doctrine was the relationship needs to die before the new one can be reborn. She's speaking this to Mormons, people who've taught their whole life about resurrection and stuff, and she's using their own religion to encourage them in this way of thinking that there's this justification for killing a relationship that's alive so that a healthy one can be reborn. Huh. That's a huge... That's a huge part of her doctrine that she brings in over and over. The relationship needs to die before it can be reborn. You know, she's got guys masturbating, guys looking at pornography, women too, whatever. And she's teaching them that as they progress in this program, their relationship needs to die until they hit a hitting point and then they will be reborn. So she starts to institutionalize this separation from your spouse. Now you can't talk about intimate stuff. Now you can't have intimacy. Now you can't kiss as a punishment as you keep progressing into this program. Now you can't sleep together. Now you can't do this. Now you can't do that. It's all this like religious idea that once it dies, it'll all flip around and get better. So you, so people are rationalizing killing the relationship, murdering the relationship for a new one to be reborn. Wow. That's, that's just, that actually blows my mind. I, I, John. What? Yeah, I, I mean, right. I saw that in in what you wrote. Um, but what? So the, is, is that where some of the money comes in? That once she splits that relationship, no, so, she's so you gotta you to get the money. You gotta have a whole big group of people that believe that these higher levels of control are justified, so that then they give you way more power than you deserve. A $3 million you know, dollar home or, or... Well, so take, for example, this. Like, um, I mean, Jody was like the... like uh, she, she was like a... She was trying to always create like some multi-marketing group of people that could do what she does and that she, the money would all flow up to her. Yep, yep, yep. And she would create the... You know, just like multi-marketing, the, the person that's that's buying the $80 shampoo is going to be a millionaire someday. You know, she was working that angle of taking the money from these people, destroying their lives and then turning them into people that would, that would uh, do the same thing she was doing to more and more people. And she would be earning money off of it. So, so wait, so she was, <laughs> she was, <laughs> she was churning out clones and then they would, they would do this coaching. Or yeah, yeah, it's exactly what she was doing. And I mean, she was basically forming like almost like a church hierarchy where then the clones need to talk to the person in authority when they can't handle it. 
How, but did she did she formalize that or like so the she would train a clone and then the clone would go out and coach? I assume it was coaching because you know to to be a psychologist yeah, takes a yeah. lot of education. So she'd have coaches and then women, they would pay her a women, percentage. Women who were uh, who were yesterday's client in the counseling therapy were tomorrow's Jody Junior. Wow. Wow. You know, there's a video that we watched at the St. George Women's Business Conference, and she seems to have these coaches all around her. They're all wearing connection t-shirts. Everyone's wearing a connection t-shirt except for Jody, and she's interviewing each of them. And, and uh, you know, Ruby is also one of them. But Oh, absolutely. Well, bless her heart, sweet little Ruby. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. This is, I mean, Jody was turning her into a Jody Jr. Jody was stealing from her. Her entire $2.5 million platform to turn it into a connections platform. And Jody was acting like she needed to do it because of the problems and the addictions and things. Yeah, there's one, arm, vi- there's one video on where knee. she calls Ruby entitled. Ruby saying all these shameful things about herself and she adds to it. Also entitled. <laughs> she goes, yeah, entitled. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, let's not forget no, that-, that one. You, you see why it was like R- Ruby was like a 747, a scheduled aircraft. Like yeah. it was just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that lady and I could tell you without knowing all of Jody's mind tricks of how she does it completely. I could tell you what the end results would be in s- after three years. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. She ha- What's her power? Influencer over people. That'll belong to Jody. What's her what's her situation? Money. I'm sure it's paid to Jody. You see, the thing is like, yes, this doctrine is just fascinating how quickly she removes from people the the cause and effect of how they really act in life, turns it into some abstract, teaches boundaries, which creates so many fights and feelings everybody's blind, grabs a bunch of people, scares the hell out of everybody psychosexually, and empowers people in a way that's totally wrong over other people and 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 um and she's got her, her whole gig going but how does she get the money so she creates these people that are supposed to be little jodies that have all these work groups she was always trying to do that she was always tr- trying to expand that but the thing is like they're not sociopaths that cult leaders they're insecure control people that need her all the time so she can't get that big you know, she, they, they can't, you know, it takes a certain kind of person to do what Jody does. And, you so, know, the, the, so here's an example of how this works. So my ex-wife's in this group, she's doing all this stuff and they're teaching in there that, you know, there's no difference between jaywalking and capital punish capital murder or whatever there's, there's really not a difference it's addiction and balance well, everybody and knows that people. come on <laughs> but, but if you get people messed up long enough and inoculate them from their senses and blind them with giving them this huge power and fear back and forth long enough and you'd be surprised how many people start to fall out of the boat like i know there's like some of us that would never over a million years of that give up that objectivity, but there's some of us who would. Yeah. And those are the people that Jody preys on. And, and so like, uh, what, what's an example? I, I was in this group. Um, I lost my train of thought. Damn it. It's great sometimes when you have trauma cause your mind just gives it to you. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, it's not good later after you're like, what am I? But um, Jody was like, uh, with her, with her, so she's creating these minion people to go out and become little Jodies and do run these groups for her, teaching her doctrine about how addiction is. Oh yeah, here's an example. So I had never thought it. My my ex wife was a 4.0 student. I think she had a possibility to go to Harvard for a short term like thing. I don't know if it was a full ride. She had a full elite scholarship to uh, Haifa University. She had learned supposedly like 10 languages. So she had an ability to say things and very quickly that she heard other people say. 
to understand their antics very, very quickly. And, you know, and she was the daughter of a general authority and she came from this family and, and the day before she left and we got in an argument, uh, she called the police on me and, and they came and we had a fight and she called the police and the police came in and it was, you know, we got a little baby. We're sitting there. There's a, there's been an argument. Uh, the police have been called that they come in and they, they say, what's going on? And she says, he, uh, he abused me. They say, well, how did he abuse you? And she said, he, he violated my boundaries. And they said, well, how did he violate your boundaries? And she said, all honesty, thinking they would think this was, she goes, he, he left his backpack on the couch when he was supposed to be in the closet. And that violates my boundaries and that does not work for the relationship. And she thought that they would arrest me and take me away. Wow. Wait, is there, Adam, is there a police report out there with... Yeah, that's in a police report. Is there a police report out there with that? Wow. That Those words are in there. Wow. And what, I mean, the police, what did the police do? They just, been, they must have just... They just like wide-eyed and shocked and tried to explain to her how that's not abuse. And the point is... Not. The no. point The point oh. is that that was Jody's handiwork. Oh, yeah. How could a person who, before they met Jody, who was accurate on tons of stuff, had some problems, I won't go into explaining those, not needed, but how... How could they go from functional to do great in school and university, functional to do all this stuff, and to think that someone violating a boundary, because it's an addiction in the head, it's not the consequence. They're targeting the addiction in the head and controlling how it moves and breathes, not the actual things people do in real life. And they're doing it like they're the surgeons and nobody else is there. They're working for Jody. How could a person actually think Suppose for a moment that you did believe that your spouse should be arrested for abuse because they left the backpack on the couch or the toilet seat up, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, but, but really did believe it a hundred percent believed it. Like, like, so, so you get this lady that now believes, I guess, down Southern Utah that, you know, duct taping the kids. It, you know, is is what's needed to make sure that they don't violate this, this these boundaries, these boundaries that are created on what ground? Now that we've left the objective world, where how you act out doesn't actually matter. Well, yeah, duct taping them, <laughs> starving them, abandoning them, but 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 somehow it appears somehow seeing those kids as a harm to others in some way, right? That was something you mentioned. Yeah. Oh, oh, that right there. I don't think Jody would have said that about those kids whilst they were with her. I think that was a sociopathic line she she shoved on the end of it just as the police were there. Really? Because she I said, don't, I don't, she said yeah, don't I let don't those think, kids, like she made the kids a yeah. threat. Don't let those kids be around other no, kids. Let me tell you how she coached my my wife in the protective order, all the allegations that she would say about how I was trying to break the protective order. So if a guy broke a protective order, he'd actually talk to somebody he's not supposed to talk to, or he would commit an action where he, he you know, he, he violated their space or something. But if you wanted to write a testimony that the police would listen to that, that didn't have any of those ramifications, but, but would get the same results, you would teach her how to say stuff like, I was with my baby and I was super scared when I saw him, how he was acting out of control. And it was super, super scary to me. And I didn't know what to do and I need some help. This guy's so scary and dangerous to me. That right there makes you think, oh, this guy's hurting her really, really bad. Even me, I'm like, where is this terrible person? I'm going to protect this lady. Wait, they're talking about me. <laughs> right. In, in yeah. other words, she taught, she teaches these women how to say stuff in a way where there's no testimony of something that would hold up in a court of laws as actually a real thing huh. to create a, a fear. So when I, when I heard that Jody, like I'm reading the news, I'm reading the news about this. I'm shocked. It's 4 a.m. I woke up and I saw Jody Hildebrand's name on this thing. 
And I am shocked. Not from like I, in this lifetime, justice is here. <laughs> yeah. You know, totally didn't shock me at all that she was here and doing this with this lady. Totally just another one of her people. Uh, but I'm reading the news. News, And then I read in KSL's article right at the end where the last paragraph where she said she, she he quotes what and they, they might want to redact that because that just serves Jody where where she says, yeah, but never let those kids around anyone again. So so when Jody gets caught uh, for controlling people in a really bad way, she distracts people from her crime with a psychosexual form of manipulation. Right, like, but it, like, it, it's not going to be effective because they'd have to... Because they're minors. They're going to have to prove... Well, they're minors, but they're, they'd have to prove that those kids had some juvenile record, or right? Like, it's it's all going to be fluff. So, so let's, let's look at it this way. Imagine that they weren't kids, which right. society's there to protect. Imagine they were 40 and 50-year-old people. Yeah. Right. And... And she said that about that. I mean, it's a, it, it, people wouldn't, they would, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, yeah. They would wonder who the yeah. victim was. They would wonder. Well, yeah, she, she'd be like, yeah, we locked him in the room for a week. This poor woman that got raped by that guy. You know, Jody would say that, make it up, just so that everybody would stop the justice from happening. Okay. Yeah. In other words, like, in fact, what's interesting if. There's a if you look at online there's something called jodyhildebrandt.com somebody's put together yep. stuff against Jody there. So it's really interesting. I guess I'm the only one that succeeded in punishing Jody up till now. Yeah. I, with the do, right. the doppel that that's credit to my father. He completely made that happen. Yeah. Uh, incredible father. Incredible guy. Oh. Huge amounts of stuff that Another day, another time we'll get into, but, uh, but when, um, when Jody actually showed up to her hearing, which I didn't know about was happening. Cause I, you know, my life's totally messed up and I'm off trying to take care of the situation with my kids. Right. I wish I had been invited to go to it, but here's an example. Her earlier hearing, she introduces into the writing, oh, there's a stalker out there that wants to hurt me. What does a stalker have to do with the violations of using somebody's wife in a dual relationship, which I we need to return to so I can explain more about that, but and and the violations of using someone's medical records to hurt them, it had nothing to do with it. It was just Jody's form of manipulation. If everybody felt she was in fear and scared and the sweet lady that was sitting there, they would try to find some understanding for why she acted in a way that she shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so she, she let, she ahead. led with that. Well, she just in her, in her just starts talking about it in the middle of the court for no reason that there's a stalker out. Right. There. So she, 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 she also potentially kind of occupies this victim territory herself. Oh, so then you go to the next hearing and it worked. She's like, yeah, there's a stalker. He's come to my house like 19 times. She acts like she's so scared that everybody sees this sweet lady that's scared from victimization. The same stuff she teaches women to do to destroy their husbands. She's the ganda. I mean, she is the master of this psychophant lie, and she's in there using it, which I t like. If you know Jody, this is what she does to distract people from her crimes. She acts like the woman that you're trying to rescue from a crime. Wow. Yeah. And so, and so there's but a group the, of guys, and they, 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 they totally fall for it. They dismiss all this stuff and think she, she's in trauma. So the board, so the board, so the evidence here is completely clear cut. She violated your confidentiality. She was in a dual relationship. Like, that's indisputable. But they said, they really said that because of her her this ploy she used that none of that mattered. I wasn't there. I just read online. You can look at the report. I wasn't there. My impression reading the report was that she got the very minimum of what she could have got. I know she was guilty of way worse and she had great attorneys and acting like she was a super frightened victim. 
from a very dangerous person was how that very dangerous person walked out of that courtroom with way less. And, and my, that's, that's, that's Jody. That's how she acts. She, she teaches people to that saying, you know, that no one got their mind around Ted Bundy because he would, he would have a cast on his arm and he had this nice smile and no one could understand how the feelings they felt when they see this guy equated to what he was actually doing. Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, with, with Jody Hildebrandt, when she talks about, like, in that courtroom, think about this. You're a professional. Okay, so I'm a, I, I do victim's advocacy. I know that if I meet a victim of abuse and it's real abuse, I tell them to go talk to the police. I tell them to go to the hospital. Right. Right. All right. It's all the red flags when Jody coaches these women through the civil process that removes children, but never takes them through the criminal process that perpetrates perpetrators. Right. And she does it in a way that completely ruins people's custody and their lives and their family and just puts, puts, puts them through health. And so, you know, here, uh, here's this, uh, to remember my point that, Sorry, it's so interesting navigating these stories because it's just traumatic for me. <laughs> and then it's like my mind disappears and I'm right back. Yeah. Are you doing <laughs> but, it? Are you um, okay? Yeah, how are you I, doing? I'm okay. I, this, was, this was worth it. Okay. <laughs> we got to get this truth out there. There's people that need to hear this. Okay. Thank you. But, but she's uh, – I'm trying to just remember my point. Sometimes my mind just goes blank when I'm – like I said, there's just tons of complexity with this, this person. Oh, but she just uh, – you know, you watch if you'd seen the 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 papers that I had and and saw how the complaints were made by the people that she was coaching on how to make those complaints and the, you know the correspondence those people had with her on asking her how to make the complaints so people believed them. Wow. A lot of pity play too, like pity play, the deflection, the victimization. Yeah, people I think a lot of uh, people that are wanting to take advantage of others practice pity play too, just so you know, that this making themselves the victim. So what you're saying, I just want to validate you too. Yeah, it's a manipulation. Well, it's just one of those things that, you know, as we get more intelligent as human beings, we start to realize that our brains are extreme, extremely complex. And there's parts of our brains that work in a way that's like visceral. And they start saying they're not a terrorist. I get this visceral feeling that they are a terrorist. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know, do you know what I'm talking about? I know about? exactly what you're talking about. It's like they're busy saying they're not one. And all I can feel is that they are one. Right. And well, there's that, a bit of projection, too, a projection there, right? Yeah. Just... Well, one thing I've learned, and I learned this on my own. I figured this out. Man, I had to figure stuff out to understand these people, what they've done. I. Uh, uh, when people repeat the same thing over and over, the subconscious starts to believe the opposite. Mm -hmm. So if your mom's like, there is a good girl out there for you to marry. I know there is. That's cool. Thanks, mom. If she says it again and then again and then again. Again, there's one thing I feel inside. There is not a girl in this world. I'm like, thanks, mom. Now I know there's not one. <laughs> you know, that's the that's the, you know, this this powerful funny way that our brains work and you get some nice innocent person that gets severely traumatized by jody hildebrandt's abuse and in broken shards they're repeating over and over i did not abuse my children i did not abuse my children i did not abuse my children there's only one thing people think about that person do not let him around children right You know what kind of power it is not just to get famous people in your group, not just to get the money from a lot, but to have the ability to execute people's everything they care about in their life. Yeah, which is what she does. By breaking them and feeding them into this funnel where you're coaching them in a way that they lose their children's system. I went to jail for 14 days. I had four criminal charges against me, four felonies, 20 years maximum. Wow. For four felonies. And, and you know, it's interesting, and this is kind of the bigger picture about the Mormon church is, 
they did a protective order and it said that I couldn't talk to my ex-wife unless an ecclesiastical leader was there or or a, an attorney. But why would they include an ecclesiastical leader in a legal thing like that? Yeah, why would they? That is very... I don't know. I'm wondering now if it was on purpose for some terrible thing. Because the bishop called me in, told me she still loved me, told me to give her a stroller, a journal back, uh uh, I, let's see a card had no writing on it i didn't want it just get get well or something uh the bishop called you in to tell you this for your ex-wife yeah, my, my mormon bishop did yes called me in called me on the phone call, called her on the phone told her as the ecclesiastical leader and he's looking at the protective order and said is this okay with you and she said it's okay and that she wanted this I, at the police station i i, I gave her those things that they asked for it and for like four days later i got like half an inch of papers that said i had four felony charges against me and those were black and white photographs of those items was the evidence for the felony charges what wait what were the yeah. what were the charges uh four felony charges felonies like uh class sure. c felony charges for protective order violations oh okay. and the I looked up the Utah law and it said that protective order violations were misdemeanors unless you had a previous criminal history as a felon. And I didn't have any criminal history and right. they had felon charges. So when I went to BYU and was late for criminal hearing because it was like my second one I went to because I had finals at BYU, I was 30 minutes late. They arrested me, put me in chains, said that the, said that the, uh, the judge was gone for two weeks, and they put me in jail without bail for the felony charges for two weeks. Wow. And during that time, Jody Hildebrandt, which my ex, went to the honor code office and started talking about, and to all their disciples that they were, following, they were bringing in, how because I didn't handle my addiction and didn't do their program, my whole life was destroyed, and I was going to prison for abuse. Yeah, I... And when I was in chains in an orange jumpsuit, and I looked across the room. I saw all the new recruits of the new wives sitting there with my ex-wife and Jody watching and smiles and smirks on their face. Jody faces. Juniors. Jody Juniors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize that I was the one that was free. Yeah. Wow. So you have been through so much. I, I just congratulations so on keeping her on being able to make her accountable somewhat. Not as much as she should have been, but you did do that, and you should be proud. You know. So as much as I don't like what my ex-wife did for me, and don't care for her as a person outside of my godly diligence to care about all of God's children. I have to defend the belief that that if you're mentally unstable and you go to a therapist and they make you a lot worse, uh, you, can't, you can't just say that this person that does all these bad things for that therapist is fully accountable for what they've done. If, if they're mentally unhealthy and they're, they're seeking mental health and a therapist messes up their understanding and their internal understanding of the world uh, that's a very gray area of you know and, and redemption of healing our society we i don't want vengeance i want the world to heal and the, the truth is everyone looks at the men that lost their kids lost all these rights i mean when i was in jail this guy told me his terrible therapist story and it was jody hildebrandt he was in a storage unit with a protective order. Now he's in jail and he's losing his kids for abuse charges. I met a guy while I was painting curb addresses because I couldn't have a normal job with all this going on. I was painting house addresses and, and, he, and he was in his house and he told me the same story. And it was all like he was fighting criminal charges in a custody case, losing his kids as well. I mean, it was just insane. The systematic methodology to which this lady massively drove these people through, and where was all her money coming from? Yeah, and, that's and a the, good question. The, that's, a, that's a very good question. Yeah, the money <laughs> thing is a really good question. Um, you know, it's, it seems as if 
she's continually gotten worse. It seems that is if her history and help me understand this is that she, she, yes, she, she gets the couple. She hurts the man. She separates them. She ruins the man's life. In this situation, it seems like she's gone a little bit further or gone. Now there are children involved. Did she have access to your children ever? Or did, is this new? Is this deeper? What's going on with having access to somebody's children? This is, this is where the friction of complexity comes in. You know how I was explaining to you that if a guy says I didn't abuse a kid like 10 times, everybody thinks he abused a kid. Yes. There's a certain kind of language that if you say, well, my ex was this in a divorce or ex was this, no one really believes what you're talking about anymore. And so, you know, like so far, we've been pretty concrete to talk about Jody and these experiences and what I've witnessed of it. And, and this is where the friction of complexity comes in. You know, if in all honesty, if we talked about um if we talked about the way that this lady affected my custody case, the extremely damaging, intricate ways with huge amounts of evidence and paperwork, but they all got away with it. And later we examined it and found out what happened. You know, it, I mean, it was, it, it's incredible. So yeah. And if, you know, she does the same thing multiple times with multiple people until the super, complex methodology becomes like a, a veneered pattern, you know, to say then, did she do this to these people's kids? Well, if she, if she, if she did certain things that led to the exact same results in 50 other women and leading into it, she knew exactly what she was doing and the people didn't have the intelligence and understanding of how she worked. Well, I, you know, I, yeah, I, I feel like there's grounds where you could say that uh, it looks like this woman did this to these kids. It looks like she could take your kids away. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I, I had a, a friend that just said, you have no idea how powerful these people are. I'll lose my kids. I'll lose everything in my life. And, and I said, Oh, I do know, you know, like, uh, not, it's again, one of those visceral things you're sitting in a courtroom where they're trying to decide, between two people arguing because they're both out of their mind in a divorce and you're outside of the logic of what people are saying you're honestly the one that argues the most you don't even want to listen to i mean nobody likes divorce to talk for a long time and you're sitting there listening to these people but then when somebody uses the visceral response if they use psychosexual manipulation or psychoviolent manipulation where they they make an allegation that's extreme sexual against somebody and someone defends it and it's thrown out of court because it was never an actual statement, never an actual real thing. That's going to change that custody case. It's going to change it in a couple of ways. It's going to freak everyone out, but then it's going to damage one of the people so much that then the way people look at them is that they're unfit to be a parent. Okay. Um, so I'll, you, I, I don't want to go into that area because we could on a whole nother podcast. And I have, we we fought this lady and, and uh, we have tons of documentation, legal documentation of what this person was. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That is good. You need that for a situation like this. Yeah. So, uh, how are you? You've doing? had a lot of, okay. go ahead. Uh, how are I mean, you've kind of shared like how are you doing today though with the like with the news in this past two weeks this story coming out? How are you doing? I personally have had a really unusual life. Um, and you said you saw this stuff. I don't know if you seen. I got a Freedom Gala Award for helping stop a dictator from killing eight hundred and fifty men in Syria, and I've been involved in really big traumatic things before where I felt like a lot of people died from stuff I was trying to help them with, but couldn't win. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just, for me, it, there are worse things than, uh, this issue, uh, because I've seen some other parts of the world and I've seen, you know, I, like I, I lost, uh, I lost the one. 
And one time I, I was going to go out on the ocean with the boat that I had stolen from smugglers to rescue people in a boat that was drowning. And I didn't go. And I thought I needed to go to this other medical place to help people instead. And, and, uh, and 17 kids died that day. And, and I, I felt responsible for it. And then my trauma from that was, was extremely bad. And for a couple of years, it was very traumatic. And, and, uh, and so like, uh, at one time I was able to accidentally grab a baby out of the ocean. Um, I remember feeling totally worthless about that. That happened two days before. And then I ran out to a boat that was sinking and the waves were huge. I couldn't even see it. I was in the wrong spot and my hand closed on what I thought was a fish and it turned out to be, to, to be this baby that was still alive. Wow. This, yeah, this little baby. I, I don't know if it's a boy or girl. I, it was too much trauma, and I just handed it to someone when I was running, looking for anyone else. But, but I remember feeling that, like, yeah, yeah, these people, they stole my value from me, so I am totally worthless, and I believe that now because they've done such a good job. But that baby's not worthless, and if I hadn't have saved it, it, it would be dead. And, and, and I knew that baby had value, so I felt like, hey – I must have some value no matter what, because at least I have the value of this baby's life now, you know? And, and so like, I've, I've had my own journey to look at a greater, deeper picture to find truths outside of a lot of the real traumatizing stuff in this life. And I believe in this great, beautiful picture out there that we just got to keep fighting for it and find it. And, and people like Jody Hill or Grant will pass. They don't have real power. They don't have love. And love is real power. They don't have real power. And and my family I got now is the best thing ever. And I love my kids. Kids love me and we're close. Uh, and and mostly, I mean, we have some issues right now that everybody does with teenagers sometimes. But yes. um, <laughs> but I, be, I believe in a good future. And, I, and, I, and so to answer your question about uh, now... Uh, I got married a year ago, uh, this beautiful, wonderful person. Um, I, I was single for 13 years. I started dating somebody that I lived with for eight, nine months, and she was killed in a car accident oh. of three years ago. Oh, my God. And, yeah, it really sucked. And and uh, Alex, and, and, uh, and it was really hard on the kids and me, and so uh, – to finally find someone after all those years. And then that happened. And then last, last year, year and a half ago, someone opened the apartment door thinking it was the Airbnb. And it was this beautiful doctor that was half Syrian and half Egyptian. And she thought my apartment was her Airbnb. And that's how I met my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally didn't think of dating her. I didn't think she'd be interested in me because it, you know, I've always wanted to say this. I always forget to say this because I know victims of these abuses are listening to me. And they care about how to be dateable again. <laughs> they care about how to be happy again. And and I, and we don't believe that we can be sometimes with the stuff. But, you know, I didn't expect that. And she came right to my – she found me. And, and we fell in love and we got married and we have this beautiful baby that's three months old. Wow, and and I'm mending some of the problems with my ch my daughter lives with me now, and my son. I'm working on some things that amount of damage this lady's done that should have been stopped years ago. Uh, I mean, it, I I it, it's just so. Oh, that that's back to my point. My point was earlier that there was a point that I lost, and now now I remember it. So. Yeah, of course it's wrong if these guys are criminalized. And if you want to study criminal stuff, the psych, the person over our custody case said that, like, uh, of the people that had special masters, that means, you know, a lot of allegations, the court puts a special master in the case. That in, in California, the special master 80% of the time would find uh, child abuse. But in Utah, they only found it 15% of the time. So there was a huge amount of special masters for people that didn't really have any crimes. And, and you know, the problem was the judges and the system to, to act like small things were way bigger. And then when special masters are there, they didn't find any real big things. So there's, there's a problem that people were mentally sick in a way of vulnerable people if this is happening in a big way. 
And, and so, but, so yeah, there are guys, a lot, mostly guys out there that have been treated this way through Jody's empire or cult thing. Uh, but the women that become her minions thinking that they're justifying a means to an end with a very dangerous thing to do. Uh, you know, the, the women that have justified this and destroyed so much in the name of Jody's doctrines of boundaries and killing a relationship so it'll be reborn and thinking it's going to bring you to this bliss that's so empowering that no one has. The women that do this, well, after Jody dumps them, after she's got what she wanted and it destroyed everything and eventually it messed up their life, well, they hold on to this stuff and it doesn't allow them to reintegrate into relationships anymore. It doesn't allow them to reintegrate into society in a healthy way. It doesn't allow them, you know, when you use like these instruments of society's trust to damage somebody extensively think under Jody's ruling, you know, when, when you're done, you, you oddly no longer believe in these institutions anymore. Yeah. You know, you're on your own. And, and you know, the damage is... Ex- you know, terrible to these men and they did not deserve it. But, uh, the damage to, uh, to these women would be harder to cure, harder to fix, more difficult to solve, more difficult to help them become good people and, and, and healthy people again. Wow. And, and so they're an extremely vulnerable group of people. Yeah. Right. Right. Like Ruby. Yeah. There was a difference between me saying, hey, this pedophile did this terrible stuff to me at scout camp when I was a kid and somebody accusing me of doing stuff to children. Yeah. In other words, when you are acting the damage to other people, that is a much worse thing to heal from than to have the damage happen to, in my opinion. Now, damage can be in totally different contexts. But, I mean, these are, like, I look at this lady, eight eight uh, passengers, as a complete person who had issues, maybe wasn't the best mom, maybe wasn't the best spouse. Right, mental health. Got in, yeah. Got into Jody's doctrine. Jody completely whirled her out of her power and her money and out of her reasonable thinking, just like she did with my ex-wife and my ex-wife truly believed in her eyes that putting the the couch the backpack on the couch was abuse that needed the police to be there like she's lost objectivity a smart educated woman with you know 4.0 tons of languages traveling the world how did it come to this right so i think that you know if we invite victims to come forward you're going to see victims, tons of stories about how Jody destroyed everything for the wife and the family. But you're you're also going to see these other victims that are the, the women that do the destruction that in their own little head have made sense to them. And they were so sick they couldn't see what was going on. And I'm not, I don't want to give a free card if someone has a prison term they need to serve. But I, but if I'm honest, I have to say that this lady was incredibly, incredibly dangerous. And the, the huge problem with Jody is that she had learned how to do the most subtle of things and the most elaborate of ways to orchestrate the most devastating of consequences right in plain daylight with nobody being able to see the moving piece that would tag her. Thank you for sharing with us, Adam. Thank you and for your time today. Um, before I finish recording, is there anything else you want to share? Yeah, a little advice to everybody that talks to somebody that comes forward. If you're out there and somebody's talking you to come for, that's come forward and they're sharing traumatic stuff, the way you can tell it's traumatic is it's like a monologue and it's like in lots of detail and it's, it's not socially normally acceptable to talk to people like that. But give them a green card. Because it's not how they are in their normal life. It is how people deal with trauma. And the other thing is when somebody's done talking about the trauma, talk to them about light subjects for five or ten minutes so that they don't feel 
triggered by feeling alienated right after talking about intense stuff. And yeah, so because I know a lot of victims are going to come forward. If you're the spouse of a guy that went suffered through Jody or the girlfriend or the mom or the dad, just yeah, just take those advice. It'll help you. Yeah. Speaking of that, Adam, have you ever been to Cirque du Soleil in Las Vegas? <laughs> What's the circus delay? Oh, Cirque du <laughs> Cirque du Soleil is like the, it's like a version of the circus in Las Vegas. It's like a... Oh, I think I've heard of it. Oh, you've heard yeah. of it. All right. Well, if you come by Vegas, if you come through Vegas, you're going to have to come knock on our door and visit and we'll have to take you to Cirque du Soleil. So it's a lot of fun right. and it's a, it's kind of a recreation of the, the circus. And if we're lucky, maybe it'll get your mind off of such a heavy subject. <laughs> Well, I, you know, the thing is, I live a pretty optimistic, fun life. It's just, it's just like everybody. We just, you know, there's these deep parts of life that were never fixed. I'd yeah. say, I would say, you also live have lived a very interesting life and a life with a lot of meaning. And I thank you for that because um, your life is a lesson to many of us. And I thank you for sharing these, the darker parts of it, despite it being good and happy and fun. Um, thank you for trusting us.